Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Megan Williams, and I am the Director of Support Services at Alzheimer Group. If you're joining us for the first time, Alzheimer Group is a charitable organization that supports people living with dementia and their families. Today's lecture is being made possible from the generous donation of the Lindsay Memorial Foundation. Just a few housekeeping issues before we begin. We're going to have everyone stay on mute. If you have any questions for Dr. Goethe, feel free to um, write something in in the chat or actually I would say the um, Q&A um, function and we will do our best to answer all your questions um, by the end of the session. If some of the questions are not answered, um, I'm sure Dr. Goethe won't mind if I email them and we can um, share them with the audience at a later time. Um, we are honored to have Dr. Goetze with us today, presenting on milestones in Alzheimer therapeutic research from 1976 to 2021. Dr. Serge Goetze is a world known expert in dementia clinic uh, related clinical research. His work focuses on studying dementia behavior and its impact on activities of daily living. He is the former director of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Unit at the McGill Center for Studies in Aging, a professor at McGill University's neuro, uh, Neurology and Neurosurgery, Psychiatry and Medicine Department. He is a recipient of the Prix Galen, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that, award in 1997 and has authored over 700 peer-reviewed articles. Dr. Goetze is also a member of the Order of Canada and a Knight of the Order of Quebec. So without further ado, Dr. Goetze, uh, the floor is yours and thank you again. Merci, Megan. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I'm honored to be able to give one of my last lectures in my career with you guys. Um, because I'm retiring from McGill and from medical practice, I have the opportunity to look back and I will share with you um, the milestones I, in, from a Canadian perspective, how far we've gone in the past uh, 30 years or so in our field. This is material I've used in a presentation at the Baycrest uh, in uh, Toronto uh, uh, a month or so ago. So it was geared mostly for physicians, but I will highlight um, where appropriate, uh, what's relevant for the public at large. And Megan will help me move the slides forward so I don't make a mistake and erase everything. Uh, next one, please. <laughs> so next one. I'm gonna make a mistake too, there you go. Okay, so when you present a lecture to colleagues, you always have to have a slide with potential conflicts of interest. It's the rule. So you list uh, the advisory boards you're part of, the activities you have with uh, data safety monitoring boards or other similar boards, and the fact that you receive uh, peer-reviewed funding from various agencies, that, that's standard practice. It's because some things I may say later about treatment may be biased and potentially biased because I work with a specific company that has this particular drug. It won't happen because we're not covering any specific drugs during the formal presentation. Next one, please, Megan. So this is the content. Even uh, when you talk to a general assembly of doctors, you, some are, of them are not as specialized as others. So you always talk with the disease in general, which is great for all of us today. What do we understand about Alzheimer? And then we get into the specifics. What happened over 30 years? And how is it relevant to the near future for us? So next one. So what is Alzheimer's disease? This is what I learned in medical school. Um, it's a condition that starts uh, over age 65. Usually it's neurologic. The first symptoms are sometimes social withdrawal. You're more quiet because you don't have as much to say or you have difficulty saying it. Uh, this is with the first hump on the left, mood. You also get a bit anxious because you're not as as fast as usual to think and make decisions. So there's subtle things happening. And then uh, cognitive function starts to decline. Uh, it's usually memory for recent things, but it could also be, where's my car? How do I get to my daughter's house? Um, not just what's your name, but um, what do you do? So it's a mix of different symptoms. And then at some point it affects daily life. And that could be depending where you are in your life. So if you're retired, it's different kind of impairment than if you're still at work, etc. 
Then there's another phase of the disease uh, where there has this big behavior hump. So this is uh, the stage where uh, not every goes through that stage, but it's common enough that we have to talk about it, where you have uh, people at night not recognizing the house. Uh, that's not the house I grew up in. Uh, not sometimes recognizing the spouse and so on. Notice that it gets better with time. All these behavioral symptoms improve with time naturally. And then um, most people uh, at the eighth or 10th year of the course of disease, there's this motricity or motor part of Alzheimer, which is like Parkinson, but without tremor. It's just slowing of gait. Uh, you may fall, uh, you trip more easily, and uh, you may have <laughs> difficulty swallowing, especially if you're distracted. So that's what we learned in medical school. Next one. What's new? since is that there is before dementia this stage of mild cognitive symptoms or mild cognitive impairment. So it's three to five years of uh, difficulty with names. What am I supposed to do next? Did I pick up the kids at daycare? Uh, but most people don't progress to dementia. That's the important thing. It could be difficulty with memory for many reasons, like your thyroid is slow, you lack certain vitamins, you drink too much, you don't sleep well, etc. Many, many things. Next one, please. Uh, this is new from a, the past 10 years. Um, the overview of changes in the brain over essentially 30 years uh, in someone's life. So before you have dementia, where you have dementia is difficulty with um, at least two memory, language, judgment kind of domains and interfering with daily life. So before that, three to five years of uh, difficulty with mostly memory. This is the middle part of the drawing where you see all these lines going up. So these are the changes in the brain that are silent, but we can measure them now with different kinds of tests. Either a scan of the brain, a lumbar puncture, and you look at the spinal fluid and you measure certain things. And soon you have blood tests also. To, that's much easier. <laughs> and that's the top one. The top line uh, called plasma p tau isoforms is the new kid on the block in diagnosis. It's um, a blood test that was designed in Sweden. And we tested this in Montreal. And many people in Montreal actually contributed to that discovery, uh, which was a big news uh, late last year, early this year, that there may be a way to measure what's going on in your brain through simply a blood test. And before any symptom, totally on the left, for 20 years, you may have zero symptoms, but there's a slow buildup of some proteins in your brain with age. And some people will get symptoms, some people don't. And the big uh, research going on now is why don't everybody get symptoms, even if they have the amyloid and tau protein buildup? So what's protecting some people? And what's accelerating the process in others? So that, that, again, that's the big picture. And next one, I think we're done with the big picture. Yeah, just to mention what tests we use. So PET scans is more for research. Um, I mean, the glucose PET scan, sometimes we use clinically. We can talk about that if you're interested in the question period. Spinal tap also, the spinal fluid, we can measure all these different proteins, amyloid tau, different kinds of tau proteins. And uh, there's some indirect measurements for neurodegeneration. So ATN is um, a new way to describe Alzheimer's disease in research. So someone with symptoms, if they have a buildup of amyloid and tau in their brain and evidence of neurodegeneration, essentially the brain is smaller than it should be, they have Alzheimer's disease. The problem is you may have a dementia that looks like Alzheimer, but there's no amyloid in your brain. So what do we call it? We're not sure yet. Next one. This is a, one volunteer from Montreal. It's a young man, he's 72. He has mild dementia, lives at home, drives his car, he's happy. And you see at the top, the MRI, where you see a little bit of um, shrinkage of the brain. And for those of you who are keen, look on the right, top right, you see this kind of slice of the brain and you see the hippocampi. Uh, they're a little smaller than they should be for his age, but not by much. The middle scan is the one with amyloid. So you get an injection in the vein, you wait 45 minutes, you see where the amyloid goes in the brain. And you see the middle picture on the, it's red in the middle of the brain. That's amyloid buildup. There's not a lot of it. And the bottom picture is uh, the new generation of tau scans that we do here at McGill. Um, and you see there's a lot more red than there should be. So that means this particular man has a lot of tau, abnormal tau protein in his brain, especially in the back part of his brain. 
and it's interfering a bit with his ability to drive alone, etc. So this is a classic ATN positive person with dementia. Thus, he has Alzheimer's disease, full stop. Even if he's early in the course of his disease, we can make a final diagnosis. Next one. Okay, so that's just the context. So we can get back to specific questions if you have during the question period. Now I'll just get into the uh, historical perspective and you'll have some nice surprises uh, because we did a lot in 25 years. Uh, next one. So we're gonna do it by blocks of years. So the first one is 1976 to 1991. And this is based on uh, publications uh, that we have uh, and some little kind of behind the scenes stories for you. The first one is that uh, we were the first uh, nearly in the world to try um, like a food supplement to help symptoms in Alzheimer's. It was choline, which is a natural product, and lecithin, which everybody knows, it's in uh, lecithin, you find that in yogurt and so on. And we tried it uh, with the help of Pierre Etienne. He was at the time a young psychiatrist at the Douglas, and he needed a neurologist to check people before he gave the medicine. And uh, it didn't help. Uh, it actually lowered blood cholesterol, but that was not the purpose of this food supplement. But we learned a bit about how to test for memory. Next big uh, item, multi-site testing of tacrin. Tacrin is a very old drug that was um, made popular by a, um, an internist in uh, somewhere in California. And uh, he gave tacrin to people and uh, one guy went back to golf and he could remember how many times he hit the ball. Oh my God. So. It looked like tacrin uh, was able to increase the brain content of acetylcholine. The thing is, it also uh, <laughs> causes jaundice, so not very safe. So we were able to test it in Canada. And to make a long story short, it was the first uh, multi-province, multi-site testing for a drug for Alzheimer's disease. And uh, we, our opinion is that we could measure a slight improvement in the interest in going back to things people had given up on. So, hobbies, like not, they want to play bridge again, they want to clean up the garage again. So interest in doing things came back, but the drug was not safe enough to be approved and we did not approve it in Canada. Around that time, 1991, big things happening. There was a study called the Canadian Study of Health and Aging. Uh, it was sponsored by the Mulroney government. It was the first uh, attempt at measuring across the country, coast to coast, how many people have memory impairment, how many people have dementia. And we got some numbers that everybody now is using to compare with. So in five years, when we have preventive measures, we'll be comparing how many people have memory decline over age 65, how many people have dementia, and compare to the 1990s, because we have all these reliable numbers from way back then. The other thing that happened that year is that we pulled together all the doctors interested in treating dementia. And we created this consortium. So it's a group of people who meet together. They uh, negotiate with uh, the governments and drug companies uh, to try to bring drugs to Canada, et cetera. And it's still very active. Uh, the secretariat is currently in Calgary. And the last item on this uh, first group of uh, historical events is the creation of a consensus conference. Uh, it's something that uh, Mark Clarfield started at the Jewish General, a geriatrician. And he said, let's get our minds together. And uh, with the evidence available in 1991, uh, should everyone get a scan of their brain if they have memory complaints? The short answer is no. Should everyone have blood tests? Yes, but just the blood test that you would normally do once a year. Nothing fancy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the one, one of uh, the still relevance for the people in the audience is do you need to refer to a specialist, everyone with memory complaints? We discussed it then, and it's still true now. No, you don't have to. If you have a family doctor that is interested and takes the time to collect the information, and it's not a complicated history, and there's no surprise on the physical exam and on the basic workup, you don't need to refer to a specialist unless the person has an interest in research, which is actually readily available in Montreal. So this is unique in the world that um, this is um, created by clinicians, not by governments. It's clinicians, not just in one uh, specialty. It's neurology, psychiatry, geriatrics, um, family medicine, getting together. And the last meeting we had was 2019 in Quebec City before the pandemic. And we had a big set of eight topics that we updated and uh, 
it, it's something that the government now, the federal government is using uh, as a um, way to create the guidelines for the future of management of dementia in Canada. So next slide is a summary of what I just said. So we can experience testing Tacrin. Uh, we had 20 universities pulled together for the big uh, epidemiologic survey, Canadian Study of Health and Aging. We had a consortium to test new drugs and a consensus approach to uh, look at the literature, medical literature and our experience and write guidelines. So it was a lot and most of it without any government support except for the big uh, Canadian study on the, the, the prevalence incidence, how many people have memory decline and dementia. By the way, as a curiosity, you may be interested to know that in 1991, 1995, those years, uh, over age 65, um, about 8% of people had dementia and 16% of people had a memory decline, and, which was a surprise. And um, we followed these people up for 10 years and found out that not everyone, of course, will progress from memory decline to dementia. And we're still thinking, why is that? What's protecting most people who have memory decline that they don't get dementia? So that's a positive kind of outcome from that research. Okay, next slide, we're moving in time to 1993-1999. So there was this landmark publication by Jude Poirier at the Douglas that there is a, a genetic um, abnormality. Um, it's not really a mutation, it's a variation of normal. So everybody has two copies from each side of the family of uh, apolipoprotein E. Most people, it's three and three, number three, number three. If you have one copy of number four, you may get Alzheimer at a slightly earlier age, but you may also get Parkinson at a slightly earlier age. If you have a head injury, it takes longer to recover. It's not specific for Alzheimer. If you have two copies, four, four, uh, that's 3% of the population at large you're more likely to get Alzheimer. And if you have a head injury, you're more likely to have trouble recovering, et cetera. And uh, this was an important finding. And uh, up to this day, we don't screen uh, for the, this particular APOE in routine clinical practice, but there's new medicines being tested that will work better if you have the 4-4. Ah, so eventually in a year or two, it may be part of the normal workup to see what kind of... Uh, a genotype you have that may allow you to go on certain medicines rather than others. Um, important for uh, the perspective of a person with dementia is um, there was an effort at McGill uh, by Ted Kaiserling and Kathy Glass, uh, an ethicist and a lawyer, to uh, propose um, guidelines um, to, to increase uh, protection for people who participate in research, but also to, to protect their right to participate in research. And it's hard for you to imagine that back in those days, the ethics committees were not allowing research in people who have dementia because they thought they couldn't sign, so can't, can't be in research, which is totally wrong. If they had indicated ahead of time in their living will that they want to be part of research later. And uh, there's also now uh, the Mandat de Protection in Quebec, the mandate that allows the person you choose to decide on your behalf about treatments and about participation in research. Um, just to go through this more quickly, the MOCA, this is a test that everybody heard about. It was designed in Montreal by Dr. Nazreddin on the South Shore in Brossard, Montreal Cognitive Assessment, MOCA. And it took off uh, like a rocket. It's been uh, translated in 60 languages. It's used uh, worldwide uh, for memory testing. Uh, the Alzheimer's Society of Canada published its ethical guidelines and it was mostly from the perspective of people at risk, people with mild symptoms and their families. So it's really from the bottom up that this was created. And we created at McGill, the last line on this, uh, a, a, a measurement tool for activities of daily living that would uh, be able to pick up this subtle increase in interest in doing things that we had noticed with Tecrin. So to make a long story short, um, we thought that we needed to have uh, questions that were different from yes, no. Can he do the shopping? Yes, no. Well, first of all, he may never have done the shopping. So no doesn't mean anything. And if he was able to do it before, 
Is he interested in doing it? You get one point for that. Is he able to plan for it? Another point. And he actually does it. Another point. So you, you break up different things, such as taking the medications on, on time and correctly uh, cooking, planning the meal and doing it completely. So this was a unique contribution of our occupational therapists at McGill, the DAD scale, which is used still worldwide to measure uh, response to treatment in, in uh, clinical trials. So the next slide is a summary of what I just said. Uh, Awareness of genetic predisposition became important. And I know it's a question we always have with these public lectures. Um, what about genes? Uh, do they play a role? Yes, but there's, there's different kinds of genes. There's the ones that can cause Alzheimer when you have 40, very rare. The one that we just talked about, APOE4, 4, 4, that may increase the risk of Alzheimer when you're 65 to 80. That's it. That's all the genes. Um, ethical issues were uh, in Canada addressed by people with symptoms and their families and everybody interested. Next uh, slide. Now we're moving to 2000 to 2020, so closer to now. Um, you may be interested to know that the old, the old name at Aricep, now called Donepezil, um, the first drug really approved in Canada and most of the world for Alzheimer, it was approved only in mild and moderate dementia at the start. And uh, you couldn't give it to people who had a moderate, but still at home, or early severe, still walking, talking, but needed full-time protection. And we tested it, uh, Dr. Howard Feldman and I in Canada, in people still at home. And we had a few Australian patients and a few French patients in France, and it worked. So Donepezil also helps people compared to placebo, people with moderate to severe dementia, at least still at home. Then there was a study done with a medication created in Montreal by Neurochem. The, the medication was called Tramiprozat. It's a pill uh, that uh, allows the brain to protect itself against the, the amyloid buildup. So the amyloid protein that we already talked about, remember the scan with the picture in the middle, the red blob? Okay, so this is um, a medication that was aimed at preventing aggregation, clumping together of the amyloid small proteins into a big ball. Um, it didn't work the first time because we, we didn't have the scans for amyloid. We didn't test people for amyloid in the spinal fluid. So out of the 2,000 people, we figure maybe 20% did not have amyloid. So it diluted the, the effect. But some smart people in Boston, under the leadership uh, of Dr. Martin Tolar, um, re-examined that database and they say, hey, it works, the drug. It works very well against placebo for the people who are double four which was 8% of the people who tried the medication. And it was a big effect. I mean, for a year and a half, people are stable compared to placebo for measurements of uh, cognition, um, memory-like testing, and uh, the ability to be independent and so on. So this medication has a second life <laughs> under another name, ALZ801. And we hope to get it in Canada, in Montreal, uh, later this year to test its oral not injection, oral, and it would be used only for those who have mild dementia with double four. Um, another important event, uh, Mematin was approved in Canada, uh, actually faster than many other countries, because there was a new um, approval system in Ottawa called conditional approval. And this may be used now for future drugs in the field of Alzheimer. So let's say you have a big study done and the results are encouraging but not definitive so do you do another study which will take five years and people cannot get at the drug or do you allow the drug to be used with restrictions um, but there's another randomized study also going on at the same time so all this to say mematin was approved conditionally and we did run a study with the help of nathan herman at sunnybrook in toronto um, and it was done and then mematin is now approved and used across the country um, just a curiosity, um, there's uh, this uh, phase of Alzheimer called uh, minimal behavioral impairment. It's a new term created by a psychiatrist in Calgary called Zainar Ismail, young man, 
smart and he said look i'm going to measure these complaints that people have when they're 50 60 um they're looking for words it makes them a bit anxious so he's measuring anxiety and then he's measuring uh, how far people are a bit sort of quiet in social groups and so on so there's a checklist now and uh, it works so well we can actually correlate uh, the fact that uh, you, if you have some kinds of complaints even your family is not aware of them. It's still subjective complaints. They may correlate with the amyloid and tau buildup in your brain. Huh. So we'll have to pay attention to even minor complaints in the future, especially if you have a blood test that shows you're at risk of having Alzheimer's disease and progression later. And finally, uh, it's a research study that uh, is going on, including Montreal. It's across the country. It's a cohort. So a, um, a group of volunteers across the country who are agreeing to have every year a checkup and some blood test and spinal fluid examination. And uh, it's an important uh, initiative led by uh, Howard Chertko, who was at the Jewish General, now moved to Toronto, because it includes not just people with dementia due to Alzheimer, but Parkinson-associated dementia, stroke-associated dementia, vascular dementia, and a mix of all these together, which is really the real world out there. So over age 85, you don't have Alzheimer caused by just amyloid and tau buildup. You also have small strokes. You also may have a bit of Parkinson mixed in. You may also have other proteins changing in your brain, and they just have numbers for now, TDP43. Eh. And... Uh, it's not that simple. That's one thing we've learned in the past 25 years is that Alzheimer is not caused by just one thing. The fact that you may have the amyloid and tau build up over a lifetime is not sufficient to cause dementia. There's a third factor at play, which may be different between people. Some people, it may be a small stroke in a specific region of the brain. Other people, it may be inflammation, which may be treatable with anti-inflammatory drugs. Other people, it's that new protein, TDP43. We're not sure yet how we can measure it and how to treat it, but it's a new lead uh, about, about that. So next slide is a summary of what I just said. Um, so yeah, collaboration between academia and industry. It's important in Canada. We, we have an opportunity to say what we think when there's a new medicine coming out, best to test it how to make sure it's safely tested and how to make sure it's tested in a way that we can pick up something useful clinically. Uh, we have this um, Tramiprozat um, being retested. Um, uh, conditional approval, I explained what it is. And um, cohorts are very important. It's just something that perhaps people in the audience are part of. The triad cohort, for instance, at McGill, the uh, Prevent AD at the Douglas, etc. Next one is the last one. It's uh, last year. Yeah, so it was the pandemic. So all clinical trials were on hold, but we doesn't mean we stop. <laughs> um, what we did is um, there were some in, in initiatives to, uh, for instance, if you have a study where you want to show people how to do exercise versus you do nothing or just usual, uh, you cannot do the ex exercise as a group, but you can do the exercise online. So this was done. And it's changed the field probably in a good way that even when we can, again, meet together, there'll be some ways to give uh, non-pharmacological therapies at a distance using uh, online. Um, we are learning also how to measure memory online at the distance. Uh, we're also measuring the impact of stress uh, from confinement uh, with people who were in the cohorts. So let's say the people at McGill who were um, well uh, tested before the pandemic, we have their brain measurements of this and that. Now we uh, call them during the pandemic twice. How are you doing? Oh, okay. But you talk to the family, the family is stressed. So people actually who have the amyloid and tau in their brain, they're not so stressed <laughs> because they perhaps don't realize as much what's happening. So that's one surprise finding. Um, the fact that uh, the minimal behavioral impairment checklist is available and widely used now multiple languages as well is uh, allowing us to find things that are unexpected that this amyloid and tau buildup is actually occurring even before you have any memory complaints the plasma biomarker was the real big surprise last year and uh, we're now going to validate uh, this in different countries different groups of people 
And if we're lucky, within two years, we'll have a blood test for people with even mild symptoms. So we will save them from a lumbar puncture and a PET scan. The thing is, if you have negative blood tests, it doesn't mean you don't have something going on in your brain. So we'll still have to design other tests for people who are negative on the blood test. And uh, the final big deal is um, the medications currently being tested for amyloid, whether it's oral or IV, they do take away the amyloid out of the brain, but there's not such a big improvement um, clinically. So it looks like you need to combine the anti-amyloid therapy with anti-tau therapy or anti-inflammatory therapy. So there's a change of the way of thinking. It's not like L-DOPA for Parkinson, which works for 90% 90 of people with Parkinson. Here, it's going to be more like anti-amyloid drugs maybe work for half of the people with Alzheimer and the other half, they need a combination with something else. So we're going to learn uh, from the experience of infectious disease or internal medicine, how to combine therapies after you do a profile of the person kind of dementia. So within five years, normally, someone with symptoms such as memory complaints for the past year, enough that you worry about it, will have a, perhaps at a distance, a first check for uh, what they do at home, how they do it well, a memory test at, at the distance. If there is some impairment, okay, they go to a memory clinic and uh, then they get a blood test, a screening blood test for the uh, buildup of the tau and amyloid protein and a regular scan just to make sure there's no surprise, too much water in the brain, a brain tumor, etc. And uh, if there's abnormalities in the blood test and the memory test is done twice and you find a progression in the difficulties, then okay, you move on to the next stage. So we're going to get to uh, personalized medicine in the field of uh, dementia. My hope is within five years, we can treat Alzheimer's disease before dementia, when it's still mild cognitive impairment. If it's the kind of mild cognitive impairment that will progress to dementia, you may have mild cognitive impairment for other reasons that also we need to find and treat like sleep apnea, uh, lack of social interactions, partial deafness, et cetera. Many things we now can do for people with mild cognitive impairment. And I think there's uh, one last slide, a conclusion one. Uh, yep, yeah, just one more, please. So I think you can see uh, with the time frame of 25 years, uh, a slow but steady progress despite relative low funding in Canada compared to the US and the Western Europe. Uh, what helped the most, um, and that's a thank you for the audience, um, it's the public involvement in the research. You can have all the money in the world, but if people don't trust you, they won't come for the tests. And uh, we were wise to have right from the start, the Alzheimer societies um, getting involved, listening to people with dementia, and now um, in the clinical studies, um, we have uh, uh, someone representing the person living with dementia and their families, always at the peer review panel to make sure that what is proposed is actually relevant to the people who will need the treatment or the care. Um, we're at the stage now where we need to talk again to Health Canada about what to expect from the new medications coming. Um, and my concern is that you may have, a, okay, it's approved and you can use it any way you like. No, I think we'll have to be smarter than that and find the right drug for the right patient at the right stage of disease and be honest about the fact that some of the new medications that are complex, IV once a month, expensive, they could cause brain swelling in the first three months. So it's not holy water, but they will be good for some patients. And I don't think you'll need them forever. Maybe one year is sufficient to take out of the brain this extra amount of amyloid. And then once that's done, maybe you move on to a second stage of treatment, anti-tau or whatever. So lots of work. So my uh, successors <laughs> will have a, a field day. But uh, as you see, uh, we, we did, uh, I think, good work. It was slower than I had hoped when this started 25 years ago, but there's been steady progress. And um, one of the biggest satisfaction I have is uh, the public participation in the cohorts, in the lectures, like you being there today. So thank you for your attention and I'll be glad to try to answer your questions. All right.
Dr. Gote, thank you so much. Um, we do have uh, many questions. Um, I do think, uh, you know, you're talking about combination meds, right? And, and how you kind of have to take things as an individual basis and see how things go. From my perspective, families have a really hard time with knowing they just want the fix, right? They want the answer. They want something that's going to help. Um, how do you as a physician go around, I guess, um, helping guide families and trying to reassure them in this trial and error stage? Um, okay, there's two different things. Um, there is the symptomatic drugs that we already have that I didn't talk about except Mematin. So that's kind of standard. You try one medication at a time. You try to reach the maximum tolerated dose, which hopefully is the therapeutic dose. You, usually there, it keeps people stable overall for a year, sometimes two years, slower decline. Then you switch to Mematin. You gain another year. That's symptomatic. That's available. It's reimbursed by Quebec Medicare, et cetera. What I just discussed is the new generation coming up. Yeah. where you will not have an improvement. It will be more of a stabilization. The thing is, I don't think you'll need, um, that's my personal opinion. I don't think you'll need to treat with these IV complex drugs forever. Uh, I think you, you need to use them uh, for what they're designed for. So take out the amyloid excess and maybe then you move on to another stage of treatment. But that's something we'll have to work on together. Absolutely. Um, so a couple questions. Um, this is a common one. Is dementia more likely to affect men compared to women? Uh, good point. So Alzheimer is more women, but dementia is more like equal, especially countries where there's a lot of smoking and men have head injuries and so on. So China is more equal. Dementia as a whole, from head injury, from multiple causes. But Alzheimer itself, uh, as much as we can define Alzheimer uh, without um, PET scans and number punctures on everyone. So Alzheimer defined clinically, uh, women are more at risk. Okay. And is there a reason why you would suspect it just? That's an old you... subject of debate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the short answer is um, hormonal changes that occur rather abruptly uh, at menopause. Um, the other thing would be, um, no, it's more hormonal. That's why the field of gender, sex and gender is such a hot topic now. And in Canada, uh, whenever you apply for a grant, you have to make sure you have uh, men and women in your sample. And uh, even in animals, you need both sex uh, because you need to be sure that uh, you look for this subtle difference between uh, sex and gender that may be biologically defined and possibly lead to treatment. Okay. Um, can you speak, uh, someone had written in, can you speak about the low dose radiation given by an Ontario doctor that had very promising results with a few patients? I'm not sure exactly what, what that is. Yeah, I know what this is. Uh, I'll have to be careful because these are okay. serious people who did the procedure, but what I've read about it in the lay press, I did not read the article in the medical journal, okay. but it sounds like four people got uh, the low dose radiation my understanding, and these are people with advanced dementia. Okay. And they were just observed for uh, perhaps improvement. I would caution people on multiple factors. First of all, you're giving a non, it's a non-structured study. There's no placebo, there's no uh, control group. Okay. Um, the other thing is you're giving uh, this experiment to people with uh, advanced dementia. So they're not competent to agree. So there are ethical rules about that. To make a long story short, if uh, even if the legal representative uh, uh, agrees, um, the ethics committees are supposed to protect people that are incompetent against useless treatments or potentially harmful treatments. So I'm just putting this in the context and uh, I'll let people uh, read about it and decide if it was appropriate. Absolutely. Um, another question is, uh, are there any comments on Lewy body dementia? Um, some researchers are saying it feels that uh, it's actually the biggest type of dementia. Yeah, it depends who, who they are. Yeah. Indeed. Thank you for the question. Yeah, Louis body refers to um, something Dr. Louis <laughs> saw with a microscope in the brain of uh, some people um, with uh, Parkinson and uh, a, a kind of dementia that's a bit 
in between Alzheimer and Parkinson. So for people who not, don't know, perhaps um, Lewy body dementia starts usually with visual hallucinations and fluctuations. You're smart, uh, very smart. And then a couple of hours later, you're a bit slower and then you bounce back. So fluctuations that are unexplained by the time of day. And sometimes also you may have a bit of muscle slowing and muscle stiffness, Parkinson-like. So it's very different from usual Alzheimer. And the other thing that's particular about Lewy body dementia is it often comes with um, a sleep disturbance called REM behavior disorder. So rapid eye movement, REM. Uh, it means while you're dreaming, you're moving, which you're not supposed to do that. And uh, it comes with this condition. And it, this condition uh, responds to medications like donepezil, rivastigmine, uh, very well, better than regular Alzheimer. <laughs> but... That being said, uh, there's a special uh, Lewy body association in the US that people can uh, sign up on. Uh, I don't think there's the equivalent in Canada. Um, if you need uh, resources uh, for your uh, loved one who, who has that condition, you, you go under the Alzheimer Association rather than the Parkinson Association okay. because the, the issue, what you need, the care you need is more al along the side of uh, dementia than motor Parkinson-like. Okay, a lot of people are asking about different types of medication um, that are found uh, around the world. Um, so one new medication is from Israel uh, for the nasal spray. Um, is that one of the new drugs that you were talking about? I don't know that one, sorry. Okay, okay. Um, another one is used in California, a drug called, oh, I'm not gonna pronounce it properly, Huperzine. Ah, Huperzine is an old one. Okay. Indeed. So, but this is not standard um, in Canada. You have to be careful when you give a talk. Uh, you yeah, talk absolutely. only about drugs approved in Canada. Okay. Um, someone's asking, how long can you take uh, deno denozepezil? Denepezil. Yeah. Denepezil. Yeah. yeah. How long? Yes. Because you were talking uh, about a good taking question. it. Yeah. How long do you think it would yep. be appropriate? So the short answer is um, it was tested over one year against placebo. So if you want to be by the book, you say it's good for a year because that's the way it was tested. But in real world, we have people who've been on it for two, three years and we're stable or slower decline than expected. So don't stop. The other thing that happened is some studies were done more recently where you stop the drug and see what happens. Well, you may have a bad surprise. You may have emerging behaviors such as agitation, uh, crazy IDs, uh, especially if you have Lewy body pathology or dementia mixed in. So stopping abruptly, if it's not for a um, reason of uh, safety, like side effects you want to stop, etc., is not advised. You may switch to something else that's safer. So let's say you've done your donepezil three years, there's a decline. You have the option of switching to the Excellent patch, for instance, which is often done. And there's a way to do that that is safe. Or you switch to Memantin, there's a way to do that also. Okay, thank you. Um, if a parent has a four four genetic uh, related Alzheimer's gene, should the children get tested? We hear this often. Um, yeah, good question. <laughs> um, careful about getting tested when you're young. Um, because you may have the burden now of knowing I'm four three. Okay. The fact that you're four three, uh, you can live with it. <laughs> it's been estimated that this slight extra risk is well offset by LT lifestyle, okay? Now, if you're 4'4", four, four, that's rare, 3% of the population, um, I would sign up for observational studies. I would want to be on a registry so I can be called if there is a program specifically for 4'4". Four, four. Yep. Okay. Um, and is there anything that they can do to protect or would that be more Wear a helmet when you go bicycling. Thank you. <laughs> hey, common sense. So as I said, the four, APOE4 genotype just in, lowers the, the ability of the brain to repair itself. It's as simple as I can put it. So if you have a stroke, it takes longer to recover. So don't get a stroke. Watch your blood pressure, take an aspirin if you need it, uh, et cetera. What, if, you're, if you have diabetes, treat it well. If you have high cholesterol, treat it well. Uh, now, head injuries. So if you have a head injury, it takes longer to recover if you're APOE 4-4. Okay, wear a helmet and avoid uh, uh, sports where you can get uh, your head bashed in, whether you have a helmet or not, like hockey. Okay. 
Excellent. Um, I was also uh, someone else. I am. I am cautious of the time because you do have to go soon. Um, how do people get involved uh, in future studies or the ongoing studies or future studies? So uh, observational cohorts is uh, currently something people may be interested in joining, whether you're uh, whatever your genotype. <laughs> um, but those who are 4-4, uh, I think there's a special appeal for them. Uh, the one we have running at uh, the Center on Aging is called Triad in French, BOV, and we're still re recruiting. So uh, my suggestion is simply to, to call uh, the Center on Aging or email us. E email is actually better because we don't, we're not physically there all the time. Uh, this is something AGI can provide uh, how to access to us. Yeah, Dr. Ro Rosa Neto is head of the program. Um, that, that's the cohort. There was one at the Douglas called Prevent AD, but that's closed, uh, meaning there's no new people coming in. It's just people being monitored over time. Um, so maybe AGI could also be a conduct to let you know if there's new uh, cohorts uh, being built up, because that's the Absolutely. way to get involved. Yeah. Absolutely. And what we'll do is when we send out, um, you know, this presentation, we'll definitely put in Dr. Rosanetto's uh, yep. contact information there. Um, I do see a lot of people kind of frustrated with the lack of funding um, for dementia research uh, in the country. Do you have a comment on that? Well, that's more political uh, than <laughs> uh, medical, but uh, it's getting better. Yeah, we have okay. a very strong leadership now for the uh, Canadian Institute of Health Research, CIHR Institute on Aging. Jane Rylett is the current director, and uh, we had uh, the opportunity this morning to talk to the World Health Organization. Hello, Blueprint on Research, and Canada was flagged as a leader, even with the limited funding. We do things that are very cost effective, like education for trainees from not just Canada, but around the world. So we already link with other countries. And uh, one way to obviate the relatively low funding is to take uh, to partner with uh, countries uh, in Western Europe and uh, Asia and uh, South Africa and eventually South uh, America. So together, uh, let's call them the upper middle income countries. We have a pool of resources and we learn together things that would not be possible in one country alone. Okay, and um, the the ADI uh, survey, I just wanted to mention that a little bit, Dr. Gauthier, because I think it's really important uh, getting feedback from, from the public. Do you wanna just talk a little bit about um, the survey and uh, we'll also make sure that people have access to it? Yeah. Thank you uh, for asking. Indeed, uh, McGill is tasked with writing the World Alzheimer Report. Hello. <laughs> World mm -hmm. Alzheimer Report this year in September. It's on diagnosis of dementia. And next year, September 2022, it will be about uh, post-diagnosis management. So this will be a big one. So to get the um, information, uh, we have surveys ongoing now and uh, participants uh, in the audience can, can sign up and and so it's not a long survey. Uh, the next one will be longer. The one for next year will be longer. Uh, so practice with this one. <laughs> it's about the diagnosis. So if you have someone who has been through recently, it's perfect that you can say how it went. Were you satisfied? Did you have uh, various tests and so on? So this survey is uh, uh, still active until the end of May. Okay, so what I'll probably do is I'll see if we can get that uh, up either on our website or send out uh, when we send this. Uh, this uh, kind of clip um, and recording. Um, Dr. Gauthier, um, I just have to ask you two fun questions uh, to end with it. I think that people have lots of uh, questions about specific medications and things, but uh, seeing as this being your kind of one last presentation, if you could have picked another career other than being a physician and a researcher, what would it have been? A gardener. So I'm doing that now. I do have my second career starting. You should see my garden. Yes. <laughs> We're all coming over. And also the last is, where is the first place you'd like to travel once the restrictions are lifted? Uh, go to Germany, see my grandchildren in Stuttgart. Wonderful. Dr. Gauthier, words cannot express how grateful we are to have you present with us one last time. We'd like to thank you from the bottom of our hearts uh, for all the support you have shown AGI over the last few decades. Your research has been invaluable contribution as we seek to becoming closer to a cure and your devotion to the families is more than appreciated. 
We are wishing you a wonderful retirement and much success in all your future endeavors. So a big thank you. Everyone uh, I can see is, is grateful for your hard work and your kindness that you've shown over the years. It's a pleasure and a privilege. So, Merci, Megan. Merci, Dr. Gauthier, and uh, we'll be in touch. All the best, okay? Bye, everyone. Salut. Take care. Bye.